Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the speaker has arrived and the principal attendee has arrived. And so uh, let's begin. This is um, the program on constitutional government. I'm Harvey Mansfield, uh, for what that may imply. And, and um, this is uh, our first meeting for this coming semester or so. And um, for our guest today is Oren Cass. Uh, graduate of Williams College and also of the Harvard Law School, so he's been around uh, this place for a while or before. He's the executive director of American Compass. It's an organization whose mission is to restore an, uh, an, an economic orthodoxy that emphasizes the importance of family, community, and industry to the nation's liberty and prosperity. So uh, before this, he was a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute, where he was working on strengthening the labor market and addressing issues from the social safety net and environmental regulation to trade and immigration, education, organized labor, the whole caboodle. He writes for the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, National Affairs, and National Review, and he's written an important book, much prized by our friend uh, Yuval Levin, called The Once and Future Worker. So uh, before this, he was also uh, domestic policy director for Mitt Romney's presidential campaign in 2012, and he was editor of the Harvard Law Review and worked for Bain and Management Company in Boston. So Oren Cass, going to talk on a conservative skepticism of markets. All right. Well, thank you very much for having me. It is, it, it's genuinely a privilege to be here and an um, excellent marketing maneuver for American Compass, which we, just, we, we officially announced on Tuesday, actually, and, and are questioning what counts as conservative orthodoxy and what is actual conservatism. And so to be able to say, well, Professor Mansfield's having me come speak about it on Friday is actually right off the bat, you... you, you at least confuse some critics, which I appreciate. <laughs> um, but I want to talk about conservative skepticism of markets and, and fundamentally um, the question of, of what conservatism is in, in America at this point and, and what maybe it could be and should be. Um, it seems to me that what we call the right of center, uh, or in shorthand conservative, at least in the economic sphere, is not actually genuinely conservative in any meaningful sense of that term in terms of a commitment to uh, whether recognizing the, the limitations of human beings and the need to build a society that uh, meets them where they are, that respects the importance of traditional institutions, uh, and, and so on and so forth. And, and I think what we have instead is what is classically called fusionism, uh, which was the coalition that, that came together to defeat communism and win the Cold War, which were very very important things, glad they did it, um, but was essentially a, a joining of economic libertarians, social conservatives, and, and foreign policy hawks um, with an agreement that each could accept each other's priorities and would have fairly free reign within their own area. Uh, and so there are ways in which the right of center conservatism, I think, is, is genuine, is very conservative even today. Uh, but on economic policy, I think it's much fairer to call it libertarian. Uh, or, or fundamentally market fundamentalist. And uh, this coalition worked in part because we were fighting the Cold War, but also I think because it came together in a period when free markets, which are something that obviously both conservatives and libertarians care a great deal about, um, were generating good social outcomes. And so whereas libertarians tend to see the free market as the end unto itself and the end of the discussion, Conservatives, I think, much more see the market as a means, a very powerful and effective means, but ultimately a means to some of those other ends that I mentioned at the beginning. And what we've seen over the past couple of decades, I think, is, um, is a coming apart, is a situation in which um, the market outcomes and the policies we pursued on that behalf were not necessarily generating the kinds of social outcomes that conservatives would say uh, we want or need. And, and so I think all of a sudden we, we've sort of had conservatives and libertarians in this coalition looking at each other and, and realizing they 
disagree fundamentally on things that they assume they agreed on. That all of a sudden they're, they're saying, no, but wait, we thought when we were talking about how great markets are, we meant conditional on how they were actually performing and what we were getting. And the libertarians are saying, no, no, we thought it was just free markets because freedom is great. And, um, and, and that conflict, I think, is a way to understand what is happening within the Republican Party right now, what is happening within the right of center generally. Uh, and, and in my view, one of the great shortcomings of what has been happening in American politics and public policy for a long time has been the absence of what you could call a genuinely conservative economics. Uh, and so, for one thing, I think a genuinely conservative economics would be a lot more skeptical of markets than it is today. And I want to here present a little bit about why I think that's the case and then start to describe what it would start to sound like if conservatives genuinely were re-engaged in the economic debates. So I'm going to start with a very long quote from Hayek. Don't worry, this is the only super text heavy slide, but I'm gonna make us actually read the whole thing because it's very important. Um, this is from his very famous essay, Why I Am Not a Conservative. And what he says is, conservatives lack the faith in the spontaneous forces of adjustment, which make the classical liberal accept changes without apprehension, even though he does not know how the necessary adaptations will be brought about. It is indeed part of the liberal attitude to assume that especially in the economic field, the self-regulating forces of the market will somehow bring about the required adjustment to new conditions, although no one can foretell how they will do this in a particular instance. Now, of course, here when he's talking about liberal in the classic liberal sense, I think he's actually describing quite well some of the distance you might expect between class, between conservatives and libertarians. And, and I wanna start by admiring his honesty. He's, he's quite straightforward here actually in acknowledging that there's, there's a faith-based component to this. The faith, the faith is in spontaneous forces that he does not know how they will work. It requires an assumption that the self-regulating forces will somehow deliver what we want in a way that no one can foretell. And he then goes on to make a very specific prediction, which I think we should hold him accountable for. He says, there is perhaps no single factor contributing so much to people's frequent reluctance to let the market work as their inability to conceive how some necessary balance between demand and supply between exports and imports or the like will be brought about without deliberate control. Some necessary balance between exports and imports. Now, one reason that's interesting is we don't usually associate Hayek with the view that there is some necessary balance between exports and imports. Uh, in fact, we now live in an era where only a rube would say exports and imports need to be balanced. And if anything, massive trade deficits are, are somehow evidence of how great we're doing. Uh, but in fact, Hayek did say necessary balance between exports and imports. And he asserted that th they were a quintessential example of the sort of thing we could have faith would happen even though we don't understand how. At the time he was writing, 1960, we were exactly midway through a two decade period in which trade in the US was essentially perfectly balanced. We, went a, we ran a very slight surplus, less than 1% of GDP over the period, ending in 1969 with a trade surplus of $91 million on more than $100 billion of trade. So the period he was writing in, this actually made a great deal of sense, but he was not describing a universal truth. In fact, we have seen just as well in recent decades that the self-regulating market forces can spin wildly out of balance. <clears throat> and I think that goes more generally. The period in which the libertarian economics that we now call conservative emerged and took uh, took its place was a period when the market seemed to just be doing great. The, the march of economic liberalization seemed to be in lockstep with rising widespread prosperity. And that's classic of, of economics generally, which though we like to call it a science, in fact, typically, tends to be a lot of folks describing what they see going on around them. So Adam Smith is all about <laughs> free trade and talking about mercantilism in the exact period when that's starting to happen. And then you get Marx during the exact period when the Industrial Revolution seems to not be going so well. And then you get Schumpeter in the exact period when you start to see this extraordinary technological progress and disruption. And then you get Keynes and all of that in the exact period when we had these problems of macro imbalances and questions of aggregate demand. And then you have Hayek and Friedman in the period when the market seems to just be doing fine with no one touching it. But that's a description of a period in the middle of the 20th century. It is not 
a universal truth. And so I think what we need to think about more critically uh, is when we actually should have faith in these spontaneous forces, because there are spontaneous forces and they can be wonderful. But when is it appropriate to have faith in them? And what are they actually going to do? Because the other place I think we've overstepped beyond excessive faith is expanding the scope of that faith, is forgetting that markets do particular things, but we shouldn't have any faith that they're going to deliver outcomes in areas where they do not operate where the forces of markets that we like are not prevailing. And, and so we get what I call, somewhat cheekishly, the, the drunk donkey problem. Uh, and, and I think a very good example of that is when you think about uh, the allocation of resources and investment economy-wide. So an interesting debate that's starting to bubble up on the right of center is questions of industrial policy and national economic development. And should we be concerned, for instance, that the US has abandoned its investment and leadership in industry, in actual supply chains that make things. Uh, I think the answer is yes, that's a huge problem. We need to talk about it. A, a, a first line response that is very standard on the right of center is to make a Hayekian knowledge claim. How can you possibly claim to know more or do better than the market is doing in the allocation of those resources? But allocation of investment across sectors of the economy is not something that the market does. You go, go back, read, read any economist you want. Go back to Adam Smith with the Baker and the self-interest. It predicts that actors pursuing their self-interest will try to maximize their own returns and generate efficiency, more output for less inputs in the process. There's no reason to believe that those processes are going to lead to a, to a generation of investment across sectors of the economy that are healthy to the long run trajectory of the economy. Because that's not something that the individual decision makers are trying to optimize for. And so the reason this is a drunk donkey problem is because in fact, if you just say whatever the market does is what's going to happen, it is as likely to be a good allocation for purposes of long run economic development as drawing a big grid on a field and asking a drunk donkey to stumble across it and then make sure the investment goes in whichever squares he happens to step through. In fact, in some respects, a drunk donkey would probably do a better job uh, because our private actors acting in their self-interest are being induced to disinvest in the United States by foreign policies that particularly try to attract that investment away from us. And if the status quo were a drunk donkey stumbling across a grid, allocating resources across sectors, and someone were to come forward and say, you know, I think policymakers should probably take a look at that and see if there's any prospect for improvement, it would not be very sensible to respond, how dare you suggest you can improve on the performance of the drunk donkey. But that's what we've done in our assumption that markets, which do some things very well, we should instead assume are going to solve problems in our society that they are not designed to solve. A second problem, and the one I think central to understanding the challenges that we are having, is the labor market. So the labor market is a market. Left, left to its own devices, I think it will behave the way we expect a market to behave in many respects. Uh, but the problem is that we don't actually want that. And the reason we don't want that is that people aren't products. Uh, and that's true in the moral sense. But for our purposes, more importantly, it's true in the economic sense in two important respects. First, people aren't products because supply is not responsive to market forces. Those spontaneous self-regulating forces that Hayek spoke about uh, assume that supply and demand respond to price signals. That's why we like price signals. That's how the knowledge is supposed to be dispersed throughout the economy and generate behavior that is going to be good for us. But we can't supply people in response to price signals. We can have a price signal saying that chemists are worth more than cashiers screaming loudly to everybody for 100 years. And households are not going to shift their production lines from cashiers to chemists. The supply of people we actually have in the economy, subject to some ability to develop education and training programs and so forth, is essentially fixed. And so we can't simply say, uh, we are going to trust that self-regulating forces are going to address the imbalances we might have. 
The second problem is that efficient outcomes are not per se good ones. Because you could say, well, it's fine, there are other markets where supply is fixed, and everything else just has to sort of respond around that, and we'll still get an efficient outcome. But the efficient outcome you might get in many markets is one that just leaves a lot of potential inputs unused. You might have an awful lot of inventory on the shelf that gets marked way down. Uh, you might just have to write it off entirely. And that is an, what we would call an efficient outcome. That's what we want. We want the market to tell us we didn't need all that stuff. Please, please don't make it. But that's not acceptable in the labor market. That's not acceptable when it comes to people. We can get an efficient outcome that tells us huge swaths of our population simply do not have market value or do not have sufficient market value to be worth employing, certainly not in the places where they are. Uh, and that could generate a very efficient outcome for us if, again, by efficiency we were simply saying we wanted to maximize outputs while minimizing inputs. But that's not actually going to give us, again, if, particularly if we are conservatives, the society that we want. And this is my illustration of the point. Uh, this is a map of every county in the United States shaded by the share of income that comes from personal transfer, excuse me, from government transfers. So 10% would represent 90% of the personal income is coming from actually earned income, and 10% is from government transfers. And as you can see, in 1979, we sort of had a nice peachy map, mostly 10, 20%, couple places getting up to 30. And we had $6.5 trillion of real GDP. Uh, now, if we fast forward to 2014, this is what the map looks like. Now, it turns out this is an extremely efficient outcome. Okay, we, we got substantial economic growth. We dramatically increased redistribution. And as a result, in terms of absolute material living standards, everybody in every one of those counties, not individual, but by segment, socioeconomic segment, however you want to cut it, everybody is better off. Everybody has more stuff. Everybody's material living standard is higher. And so we could just, we could, we could declare victory and, and go home. This is the exact economic model that we've pursued. Uh, it's what I call economic piety, which is an obsession with the idea that there's an economic pie, and as long as you grow and divide the pie, everybody can have more pie, and who doesn't like pie? Um, I like pie, but it turns out it also matters who's baking the pie. And a model that simply says we can push ever harder, yes, we're going to create winners and losers, but the winners can compensate the losers. Uh, is a very pro-market approach to economic development, and it is an extremely unconservative approach. And I believe that we are all paying the price for it as a result. So what's gone wrong? Well, it seems to me that when we think about what it would look like for a market to be performing well, what we should be asking for, what a conservative approach to economics should be focusing on, is a two-step model of how the economy actually grows and develops. We all love talking about step one, which is the dynamism and the disruption, right? These, are, these things are key and we should celebrate them. And the more you show you are sophisticated by celebrating most aggressively disruption and showing you care less than anybody else about the costs of disruption because you know how good it is. Uh, and disruption, disruption is necessary, but disruption isn't good. Certainly, if you're a conservative, there's nothing good about disruption. Other things equal. If we could get more progress with less disruption, that would be better. And even to the extent that disruption happens, it's not necessarily good. And a really important example I want to emphasize here is let's talk about the mechanization of agriculture. So it's a very straightforward, well-understood point that, of course, it's great that we don't all still work on farms. Right? We should celebrate the fact that once 90 plus percent of people worked on farms and now only 2% of people have to work on farms. Well, on the one hand, yes, I agree, that's great. But, but, but there's a but there that we, we assumed and then just forgot about altogether. If we had mechanized agriculture and said we only need 2% of the people to grow all the food, and then everyone else should just sit at home and wait for the tractor to come around and bring them the food. I don't think that would have actually been progress, certainly not from a social perspective. Okay, there was a second step that made the mechanization of agriculture actually a good thing, 
And that was on the back end, the economy that was generating new and better opportunities for people. In fact, that's the only reason the mechanization of agriculture was a good thing. It's that it freed up the people that we had something better for them to do. But that process isn't automatic. And in fact, it's broken down. This is productivity in the manufacturing sector over three recent periods. Uh, you know, productivity growth is actually a pretty good measure of disruption in the sense that it shows the extent to which you can build more stuff with less hours of work. So when we claim that there's lots of automation going on and so forth, in theory we're claiming we should see a lot of productivity gains. Now one thing to notice is that productivity is not accelerated. Uh, productivity growth over kind of the golden age, a middle age, and the recent age has been pretty much steady. It's actually down a little bit. If you actually zoom on the most recent 10 years, it's way down at all-time lows. Manufacturing productivity has actually declined in three of the last five years. So the story that robots are throwing everybody out of work is, is simply false. Uh, but, but let's zoom out a little bit and talk about three eras during which, which we were getting good productivity growth. And it's striking to see that while the story is that we've lost all of these manufacturing jobs because of all this productivity growth, in fact there's no correlation whatsoever between losing manufacturing jobs and productivity growth. And the reason is because there's a second question. How much more stuff were we making? In the first period, value add in the manufacturing sector was rising faster than productivity. So yes, people were becoming more productive, and we were making even more stuff even faster. In the middle period, they were about the same. In the recent period, what's changed is we stopped making more stuff. Now put those two numbers together, and you can then, with the virtually the exact same productivity growth, have one period where you add 3.4 million manufacturing jobs, and another one where you lose 5 million manufacturing jobs. Now if you want to be pedantic, it is technically correct that this productivity growth cost us all those jobs. Because if the productivity growth had been zero, maybe the jobs wouldn't have gone away. But I think it's very hard to look at this picture and say, well, we lost those jobs because of productivity growth. We lost those jobs because we, we lost the second half of the process. We lost the market that was actually taking the productivity gains and using them to create more and better opportunities for people to make more stuff. And so economy-wide, I think we have what I call the James Harden problem. I don't know if I, hopefully we have some basketball fans in the room. Uh, and hopefully, as a true basketball fan, you hate James Harden. Uh, for anyone who's not a basketball fan, James Harden is a remarkable player. He leads the league in scoring every year. He was recently the most valuable player. And he does that mostly with a very unique move called the step back three. Uh, the step back three is when he dribbles for 15 or 20 seconds out of the 24 second shot clock then charges two steps in as if he's going to dribble to the basket, gets his defender leaning back, steps back a step, and hoists a three-point shot. <coughs> now, it's not actually an especially high percentage shot. He makes about a third of them. Uh, but it's worth three points. And so it turns out that actually being able to make a third of your three-point shots anytime you want with no help from your teammates is a fairly efficient way to play basketball. It's also an incredibly boring way to play basketball. And there's a, beyond wanting to spend a minute complaining about James Harden, there's a point here, um, which is that I think there's a really interesting analogy between how we think about market economies and how we think about professional sports. Okay, professional sports is a system in which we set up a competition, we ask people to compete within the set of rules we've designed, but the competition isn't actually the point. The way that basketball owners make money, the reason the league is successful, is not by winning the most games. At the margin, it helps a little bit. But what matters is that it's an entertaining product. Now, you could try to generate an entertaining product with central planning. That's what world wrestling does, right? You could generate an entertaining problem by scripting out, OK, now, James, I want you to dribble here. Now, you try to block him. I mean, may, the Harlem Globetrotters actually do that, right? You, that, you can create an entertaining product that way, but the premise of professional sports is we're going to create the most entertaining product that satisfies the most fans, generates the most revenue, uh, by setting up a competition. And within the competition, everyone's going to try to score the most points, right? If James Harden tries to showboat and be entertaining, we're all going to boo him and say he's not doing what he's supposed to do. 
but we're going to trust that, that that competition is going to generate the spillovers that we actually care about as a society. And that's actually the premise of setting up competitive markets in our society. It's not actually important to us who is winning the competition in the markets or whether they're earning a lot of money doing it. The profits aren't the point. The point is that all that competition is supposed to generate spillovers for our society in terms of innovation, new and better things, higher quality of life, better job opportunities for people. But it's not inherent in the system that's going to happen. And you get the same problem in sports. For one thing, there are very boring sports. Right? Like, well, actually, curling we all pretend to care about once every four years. But curling is actually a very boring sport. Uh, it, it, you would not build a professional league around it. Even the very successful popular leagues face a problem over time, which is that people find efficient ways to win within the competition that don't generate the spillovers that we care about. Hack-a-shack, James Harden and the Step Back Three. The NCAA actually banned dunking in the 60s when Lou Alcindor, later Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, was too dominant. Then a few years later they said, you know, it would actually be much more entertaining if people were allowed to dunk. They brought back dunking. Right? In baseball, we've had to lower the mound, we've had to raise the mound, we have to juice the ball. Baseball is going through a crisis right now, too, where there's such an obsession with the efficiency of the three true outcomes, walks, strikeouts, home runs, that less and less of the game is now dedicated to actual entertaining play on the field. Baseball is going to have to do something about it. But it would be ludicrous to step back and say about the NBA, well, guys, this is just the natural state of the world, that obviously natural law demands that basketball be played this way. So if it's boring, just sit there and watch anyway. Uh, we change the rules. And likewise, I think what we have seen happen in the market economy is that over time, under the set of rules we've set up, and this has happened in other eras as well, people have found really efficient ways to win within the game that do not generate the spillover benefits that we want. And you could run off a list of things that I would call the step back threes of the modern economy. Leveraged buyouts, merger and acquisition activity generally, cost cutting, offshoring. All, I mean, anyone who has or will ever work for a consulting firm will discover that like 2% of the projects are actually growth strategy projects. And 98% of the projects are how can we increase profit without actually making any risky investments and certainly without hiring any additional American workers because that's not actually the best way to make profit right now. And so honestly, that's not actually a, that's not a criticism. It's not, as much as I disdain James Harden, he's doing what he's supposed to do. But it's our job to say that the rules therefore have to change. So what would conservatives say about economics? If conservatives are actually ready to come forward and say, you know what, uh, what we've been doing the last 40 years isn't working anymore, and if we have conservative values we care about, we're going to have to start talking about them, including them in how we talk about economic policy. I think there are a lot of things we would think about differently. Oops. So one is the importance of inequality. And this goes back to the blotchy map I showed in the middle. It is absolute dogma on the right of center that inequality does not matter. As long as everyone's absolute living standard is going up, everyone's doing great. There's actually a very famous speech by Margaret Thatcher in the House of Commons where she ridicules labor and then she does this whole thing with two fingers where during Prime Minister's questions where she says, she's basically got the upper class and the lower class and she says, they would rather bring themselves down to here if it means everyone else will come down to here. Everyone, everyone does like a funny British accent chortle. Um, but here's the thing, if you're the lower group and you want to be living in a society with an intact social fabric, opportunity for your kids, markets that are responsive to your needs, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that this world is a heck of a lot better than this world. Okay? And, and not just for social reasons, not just because well, I, I feel bad about inequality. It's not about feeling bad about inequality. It's about all the very real and tangible ways conservatives would take seriously the changes to quality and nature of society and life in a society that looks like this. And we'd want to do something about it. We would think a lot more about the benefits of constraints on markets. This is the James Harden point. We would say, actually, it's our job to put constraints on markets and channel the competitive forces in the direction we want. So one of my favorite examples of this is the tight labor market problem, where the, the free enterprise fans will, will deliver you know, 
page-long odes to the extraordinary power of the free market and competitive forces to innovate and solve any problem. And then you say, well, here's a problem. Do that with the workers already in America. And like, and like their heads explode. Like that's impossible. We're all going to starve and the economy is going to collapse. Uh, but I don't think that's true, actually. I think if, if the key problem you had to solve to be a profitable businessman in America was finding a way to productively generate profit with the workers who are actually here, I think we'd actually get a lot of really interesting, innovative competition that did that. And I think we should. On the flip side, we would take a lot more seriously the costs of disruption. We would stop saying, and actually, it's, I, I'm a hoarder, so I was, I was looking recently at my, my first Econ 101 paper I wrote at Williams College, which is a little 500-worder on, on the wonders of free trade. And it actually has the sentence in there. Um, I'm not going to quote it exactly, but it essentially was, um, people who lose jobs will move into other ones. A. Uh, but that's not true. And if your theory of free market require of, of, of free trade and good economic policy requires people who lose jobs will move into better ones. It's not a very good theory. We think a lot more seriously about trade-offs between diffusion and agglomeration. And, and, and I think there are two dimensions where this is important. One is how we think regionally. It's extremely fashionable to highlight the incredible power of agglomeration and the productivity gains we get from having economic activity concentrated in places like San Francisco and New York. Now, for one thing, I'd, I'd go take a look at that research. It's not, uh, not sure it's quite as good as, as uh, our, our salutes to regression analyses would have us believe. Um, but more importantly, there's a second side to the equation. What are the benefits of non-agglomeration? Or put another way, what are the costs of agglomeration? What happens to everybody else when you agglomerate? Because they're not all going to move to San Francisco and New York. And one way to see that is to ask yourself, you know, at the margin, let's say we were thinking about where the next unicorn was going to set up shop, which would be better for America, if it set up shop in San Francisco or if it set up shop in St. Louis? Now, agglomeration economics tells you it would actually be better if they set up shop in San Francisco, because they're going to get all those benefits, they're going to be more productive and efficient and successful. I don't know that there's anybody who could look at the real world around us and say it would actually be, be better for the total utility of this country to have that business based in San Francisco than St. Louis. But we're going to have to acknowledge that there's more to the story than just all of the great benefits of being in San Francisco. So that's one, the geographic one. The second is we celebrate all the efficiency of, of, of conglomerates. And there is great efficiency to that. But conversely, we also have to actually recognize the incredible value of local ownership. Right? I don't deny that Home Depot will sell you a screw for less than a small hardware store would. That's absolutely true. But that's not the, that, that is not the end of the economic conversation. That consumer welfare maximization is not the only thing we would take seriously. We would ask what the value of local ownership is to the fabric of the community, what it means to the opportunities that people within that community have if there's an employer who's actually based and making decisions in the community, and so forth. And so that would be part of how we analyze things. We would think a lot more seriously about value of non-market labor and value of non-market goods. It's a really awkward problem for our market fundamentalism that most of the things we care about in life are not in the market. Like, oops, well, like maybe we should have had that in our models. Uh, but if you were to kind of make your stacked bar of all the things that determine your quality of life and satisfaction with life, the share of them that you actually buy and sell or have a price is just not very large. And so to assert that we are maximizing welfare when we maximize consumer welfare is simply a foolish assumption or assertion. So I did goods first. The labor point is one that's been driven home to me, especially over the last 24 hours. Um, I just put out a report showing how the costs facing a household have gone up much faster than a male wage earner has seen his wages rise. Now, one of the responses to that from the economists of the American Enterprise Institute uh, has been, well, thank goodness the emancipation of, of women has ensured that both parents can work all the time, and therefore they can afford all these things. Now, that's true. One of the ways households do manage to afford all these things is to have two parents working. And in fact, during the editing phase, I was pressed a lot on the question of, well, shouldn't we be showing this 
relative to household income. And I said, no, I'm not going to show it relative to household income unless you can tell me how I'm going to calculate all the value that a parent who's not in the workforce brings to his household and his community. Now, we pretend that you can fully substitute that with a daycare center, but that's not a full substitution at all. And especially if we were conservative, we would take much more seriously the value of all of the work and effort people who are not in the formal labor force provide and the losses we suffer when we trade that off for labor that comes with a wage that we can count as GDP. You can tell I'm getting to the bottom of the page, so don't worry, I'm almost done. <laughs> we would think differently about the relationship between capital and labor. I, I, for the life of me, cannot figure out why it is a valid assertion that policies that maximize shareholder value in the short run will also be good for workers in the long run. But policies that maximize wages in the short run will ultimately be good for shareholder value in the long run is not an equally valid claim. Kind of from a Herbert Wexler neutral principles perspective, I don't know how you can tell them apart. I don't think either one is necessarily true. Certainly neither is true everywhere and always. But to simply trust the first as a good way to run an economy and think that the second is ridiculous, I think is an ideological commitment, frankly, that, that comes at this point in good faith. I mean, you could tell like, oh, it's the donors or something. I don't think that's even true. I just think it's something we don't think about. And conservatives would. We would grapple with the free trade, free market dilemma. I, a place like Harvard, I feel like I should have to bring a trilemma, but I only have a dilemma. Uh, and it's this, free trade, free markets, pick one. Now supposedly free trade is how you show your commitment to free markets, but if free trade means including into your market markets that are governed by authoritarian communists who wildly distort prices and incentives, then I'm not sure how that improves the freedom of our market. I'm talking about China. <laughs> And it, it, I, I actually don't know how you can be a fan of free markets and be committed to the idea that the freer market is better for innovation and all the outcomes we care about, and then say that in policy terms, the way you're going to realize that is to allow Chinese firms and laws to be a part of our market. There's actually a trade-off here. Those don't go together. And I think conservatives would much more greatly value the integrity of the domestic free market over the globalizing impulse. And finally, I think we would tell ourselves a different story about what it is we're trying to achieve here. I think the, the corner we have gotten ourselves into is that policy is focused on turning a bunch of dials that maximize economic growth. And as long as we are maximizing economic growth, all the other good things we want in life will follow. Again, not a very conservative way to think about the world. And in my view, not a very good way to think about the world. Uh, and it is that problem is being borne out in the fact that we've done a lot of dial twisting, and yet the, our capacity to generate growth in our economy keeps going down. I think it would make a lot more sense to flip that around and say economic growth is an emergent property of a healthy society. And the way we maximize growth over the long run isn't the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. It's a policy environment that's actually going to get the foundations of our society right, and that when those things are right, the growth will come, as it did in an era when, by the way, union concentration was five times higher and the top marginal rate was three times higher. And the same goes for individual liberty. And this is a point I think Senator Josh Hawley makes very well. Uh, the way that you maximize individual liberty for our society is not to make sure we are maximizing the individual liberty of every single decision for every person at every point. Actually, doing that is a great way to make sure you end up with an incredibly unfree society in the long run. And so those great things that are in the, in the mission statements of all of our think tanks, free enterprise, individual liberty, limited government, I agree, we want all of those things. But the conservative looks at those things and says, the way I get those isn't by just evaluating every economic policy with, as Jack Spencer, the head of economic policy at Heritage said, just asking the question, what maximizes economic freedom? We get those things by actually being thoughtful about the policy environment that's going to build the good society that actually lets us realize those in the long run. Thank you very much.
Well, that was full of interest and, um, and possible contention. <laughs> and visit AmericanCompass.org. Yeah. All right. So where do we go? Pat. Uh, yes. Uh, first of all, I have been playing basketball for 65 years, and I hate the three-point shot. So uh, I think it was the worst thing that ever happened to basketball. Um, that, that and baggy shorts. <laughs> I think they get rid of the dump also from that. But um, I wanted to, uh, I, I had noticed this conference in the, uh, the summer in which you were engaged in some debate on industrial policy. Now, of course, industrial policy, this is not the first time we've heard of it, it was very prominent in the 80s and it was firmly rejected by the uh, Reagan ad administration. And, Don Regan, who was great for, for quotes, had, you know, you know, we had a bunch of bureaucrats sitting around picking winners and losers and, and so forth. So um, I guess that my question is, what are the contours that you uh, think would formulate an, an industrial policy that would be, that would be effective, uh, particularly considering that the state of manufacturing today is, is really just minuscule compared to where it was in the in the 80s when the PMs period. Well, I would take some issue with the idea that the Reagan administration rejected industrial policy, at least to the extent that, you know, between the Plaza Accords and the Japanese import quotas and what they did with respect to Japanese chip makers, um, there, there was actually a much higher level of protectionism aggressively advanced on behalf of industry uh, then certainly we would associate with Reagan. Um, and in fact, I mean, among the, uh, that is in part why we have a Japanese auto industry in, in the U.S. now. Um, in terms of what the contours of, of in industrial policy would look like today, I think there are sort of, there, there are three components. One is um, actually identifying some goals that we should have. So actually being comfortable saying manufacturing matters. Um, manufacturing matters in ways that a drunk donkey won't be aware of, um, in part because of the kinds of employment opportunities that it provides, uh, in part because what it means to the health of local economies that otherwise essentially have nothing tradable that they're able to produce, um, because of what it means for broader ecosystems and the complexity of supply chains and uh, the fact that what you make in one area affects what you can or can't make in others, and what you make today affects what you can and can't make tomorrow. Uh, and then, of course, there's the entire sort of national security side of it, which, which I tend to focus on less because I'm so interested in the economics, but for many people, it's actually the, the should be number one on the list. So, um, so I think saying there's actually a policy, pre valid policy preference here that we should have confidence lining up behind is step one. Um, and then I think there are two areas of policy. One is on the trade front. And um, going back to the Hayekian idea that some balance between imports and exports is actually necessary. Because you know, other things equal, actually, I think free trade is great. Uh, but it has to be free trade. The word trade is actually super important in there. If, if we were importing $600 billion of stuff from China, and China was importing $600 billion of stuff from us, uh, I think we would be much better off than in a world without trade. Uh, the problem is that it's 600 to 100. And that is both a problem because it means, therefore, we didn't see that real value add growth. The other 500 is just domestic production that does not occur. Uh, and secondly, because it actually still is trade. We have to send something back. And what we're sending back is IOUs. Um, so, so what you would what you would do about that? You know, first of all, I think you would take a much harder line on China, which the Trump administration has started to do, but not in an especially strategic way. Um, you would, I think, very aggressively go after intellectual property theft, market access issues, and so on and so forth. And you'd say, given the our our ideal is what I just described, but given the choice between what we have and very little trade, we would prefer very little trade. And then at some point, then you kind of have to put up your hands and say, and now it's up, and now it's up to them. Um, so that's one component. And then domestically, I think we need to do a lot more to invest in 
um, our capacity to do those things well. So um, one component of that that I think, uh, for instance, the German system actually does very well is um, essentially public-private partnerships that commercialize um, technology coupled with a much greater R&D focus at the, at the university level on things relevant to manufacturing, um, whether that's material science, logistics, robotics, and so forth. Um, so there's that component of it. I think we need a totally different approach to environmental regulation that says, yes, there are negative externalities associated with big industrial products, projects, and there are positive externalities. And relative to where we are now, the positive externalities are actually a lot bigger. Um, and then I think we need to have a very different approach to the education system um, that says, batch, you know, BAs, well, in two parts. One, to the extent we are subsidizing higher ed, it is for engineers. Because if at step one we said manufacturing is more important than dance, then at step two we get to say we're going to subsidize engineering degrees and not dance degrees. Um, no offense, I don't know if you have a lot of dance majors at these, but <laughs> dance is wonderful. Um, the, the expression of the human body and all of that. Um, right. But then also we should, have a, we, we should be investing much more intensively in non-college pathways and actually putting people into the workforce sooner, um, particularly people who can and will excel in exactly these kinds of jobs if we subsidize their movement into them the way that we currently lavish money on people who are hanging out at places like this. Um, so those are sort of the components that I would lead with. Yeah. Land, Professor Landy. I'd like you to elaborate your inequality discussion um, in the context, right, of rising, rising boats, right? You're saying even in a, an economy that's growing mm -hmm. satisfactorily, you still would worry about inequality. And uh, there's an old argument by a wonderful old economist, Hirsch, who you're probably familiar with, about positional goods, mm -hmm. and certain things are can't be expanded, and I understand that leadership and, and uh, beachfront property, but but I think you're you're trying to dig deeper here. Yeah, and uh, so dig deeper. Yeah, so so positional goods is certainly a component of it, and like you said, that's that's nothing new to to, to recognize that those are important. Um, I think the two other elements that. Um, that, and I'm doing, I'm working on this. I need to formalize it better. So this is a, this is a little um, unstructured, but the, the two elements that I think are really important, one is the way in which um, markets will tend to focus on and meet the needs of people who have a lot of disposable income. And I think what we've seen in recent decades is a shaping of our society and, and economy and focus of investment on the upper middle class consumer. And if you, if you have a huge divergence in economic well-being, even if you're still seeing absolute material gains at the bottom, I think you still end up in a position where essentially the economy and society aren't for you anymore in a sense. And yes, there's actually a very important emotional and cultural element to that, but I think there's also a very tangible utility element to it. Um, so an example would be, well, so two very different examples. One example would be um, vacations. So 50 years ago, the standard family vacation was a road trip to a national, I mean, I'm wildly overgeneralizing, road trip to a national park and you stay at the Howard Johnson's. Um, today, all of our investment in hotel and vacation amenities are, from a profit-maximizing maximizing perspective, wisely focused on much higher-end vacations. And if you are someone who has a little bit more income than you had back then, you could still do the road trip, but we've focused much less on the quality of the natural park experience, and the motel is going to be not nearly as good, and so on and so forth. Um, and so that's a, a substantive utility issue, and then along with that comes the problem that also, the idea of doing a road trip and staying at the motel is now a punchline on, for Saturday Night Live, not something to be proud of taking your family on. Um, a totally different example, the other extreme that I think is really interesting is um, in a market like healthcare, where you have risk sharing. And so whether or not you as an individual can afford and would be best off in a system that, um, frankly, said some, you know, some of the highest end treatments are just not affordable to you. 
um, your insurance premiums still reflect a market that assumes that everyone should have access to those treatments. Now, could you address some of that with deregulation and offering different kinds of insurance products to different people? Maybe. Um, but you'd still have a problem that then, among other things, all of the best doctors are going to be serving the people who are in the high end of the market. Um, if you want to try to hire a teacher for your community, you can't pay them as much as the teacher in the higher community. So I think that divergence is really important. Second category is network effects. Um, there's a, a, a book I highly recommend um, by a Stanford economist called The Human Network. And it takes all of the very interesting research being done on network theory and dynamics of networks and applies it to human relationships. And what he shows is that human networks naturally, um, I'm going to forget the cool technical word for it, but sort of separate. And when you have separation in networks, you then get very interesting system systemic behaviors. So the example he uses is, let's say you have two clusters of people. Do you have his name? Uh, something Jackson, Matthew All right. Jackson, All right. the human network. Um, reviewed by yours truly in the Wall Street Journal. Okay. <laughs> um, so the example he gives is, okay, let's say we have two clusters of people, and let's define some basic rules. Let's talk about dropping out of the labor force. And let's define the rule that if half the people you know drop out of the labor force, you drop out of the labor force too. And he says, all right, so let's draw this network. And let's say there are sort of a relatively high level of connections between the two sides of the network. And let's call these a high income and low income network. You can pick a bunch of nodes and have people drop out, but it doesn't cascade because people also still have connections to the other side. Once you thin the number of connections between the two sides below a certain level, it cascades. And instead, you end, get to an end state where everyone's out of the labor market. Now, on the one hand, that's a totally abstract kind of theoretical thing. But I think it's describing something true, that as we get greater SEP divergence in incomes, we naturally get greater divergence in, in where people live, in what their networks are. Um, I think people, you know, particularly who go off to college and end up with networks based around colleges, end up with a much higher share of their relationships, not even being local. And you lose all of the cross subsidies that you used to benefit from in a community by virtue of being the low income people in a mixed community. So those are examples. Thank you. Yeah, Susan Chow. Um, yeah, a couple questions. Firstly, just because you just mentioned it, maybe you could say something about how this would translate for healthcare purposes. But the second thing also just Stemming from what you just said, I'm very, I'm extremely sympathetic to, and I'm, I, you know, but I'm not conservative. I'm not a conservative, but I, I, lo I love almost everything that you say. Um, Makes you conservative. Okay, but it's all in the name, right? It's all in the name. That's I'm, a problem I'm really, right there. Yeah, so how, it's all, in, it's all in definite. All in, but, but I do come to these things, so I guess that, uh, that says something. Um, you, sp I, you speak a lot about local community, and maybe this is where. The, the conservative thing kind of does, you know, the, the, the little platoon and all that. But we're also, you also are very careful to, to talk about our country and our national interests. And this also would <laughs> distinguish you from some free market people who say, no, the relevant, no, you know, it's the whole world. Mm -hmm. And if we're, you know, it's not our, it's not our benefit, it's the whole world's benefit and people here in India are richer and so on. So what if some of us are poor, it's better for the whole world. But you're, you're focused on, the, on our country and its interests as a legitimate kind of parameter mm -hmm. to, to, to. So that being the case, what about civic identity uh, nationally and not simply locally? In other words, I'm wondering if you could say something about the way inequality harms a sense of na when When everybody yep. took the train, whether it was first class or second class, you know, those great old movies from the 30s, you know, the, the 20th century, when, you know, when the rich are all in their private planes and the rest of us are sort of you know, in the steerage of the, at, at, in the regular, it, it sort of destroys a sense that we're all in it together, mm -hmm. which can have really damaging repercussions down the road. When the rich lived in gated communities and they don't have to mess with traffic and, and so on. Mm -hmm. So what about that part of it? In other words, the national interest, the political interest, which has to be more than local. Is yep. there some way in which your conservative critique of the market would, would, would translate yep. nationally? Yeah, so I, I think the national component of it is is very important. There's a very interesting tension within these right of center debates right now, which is that 
if you know if if you were to go ask people like well what do we call Oren that was weird they'd say um, oh well he's a national conservative that's that's actually the term being used for it right now because this idea of, of a national identity as contrasted with the kind of global who cares as long as GDP is going up model is is a distinctive component of it. Um, but you're right that it conflicts somewhat with the local emphasis. And so one thing some of the folks being called national conservatives say is, well, it's all relative. At the world where the kind of neoliberal alternative is globalism, then yes, we would like to say, let's not forget about nationalism. But our ideal isn't, well, let's do everything at the national level. Our ideal in a lot of cases is let's get back to something more local. So I, I think there's a lot of tension in the relationship between those things. Um, in my mind, the national component is, is incredibly important to focus on um, for two reasons. One is um, that our politics is national. And our politic that is the, the level at which we have a lot of our fights. And so from one side, I think it's incredibly important to reject the idea of, well, if some of us get poorer but we helped people in other countries, that's, you know, that's welfare enhancing and good policy. Um, if you want to make that case as a matter of foreign aid, that's fine. But if we're going to be a democratic republic, um, then the constituents are of the elected representatives are the interest group. And that's not a xenophobic or provincial view. That is a description of how it has to work or everything else actually breaks down when you start pulling on it. So, so I think it's... A, Still, that's the defense of America first. Uh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> right. Which, by the way, was John McCain's slogan, right? Like, every, oh, oh, was it? That's weird. Like, yes, actually, it's, I guess it was country first. But, um, yes, it's actually bizarre that someone would try to contend that they want to be a leader of the American people, but they are not going to advance the interests of the American people. I don't, I don't know how you go down that path coherently. Um, the second component I think that's really important um, is is an economic one, which is that um, a lot of the ways, and this goes to this kind of free trade versus free markets point, um, one problem is you have an awful lot of countries that are not free markets at all. Another problem is you have ones that are just at wildly different stages of development. And the idea that you will improve the well-being of the average person in the more developed country if you redefine the relevant labor market as developed country plus extremely underdeveloped country, again, is just not supported by actual economics. Um, now, you can say, well, you're going to generate more overall output and redistribute to those people. But if you're talking about how the labor market feels to them, it's not going to be good. And so I, I think it's, you know, if we had relatively free trade and common standards and so forth with the EU, that's fine. That's not... That, that's not the issue. The issue is the model that says we should expand our labor market to include markets at wildly different stages of development that I think has very serious consequences. Um, and, and so those are the ways in which I think the, the national border is really important. And then the, the point you're making sort of about solidarity, I think then, then goes to both of those. Because as a political matter, I don't know how you operate a national political community if you've thrown out the solidarity in the sense that people actually have some responsibility to each other that is different from their general responsibility to mankind. Um, and then economically, I don't know how you um, actually get the market outcomes that we want if people aren't bought into the idea that we have that obligation. And that's that point I made about how we should actually be comfortable with constraints. We should actually be comfortable saying, you as a capitalist in this country, um, capitalism is not a system of people with capital get to just go get whatever they want from whoever they want. <laughs> capitalism is a system by which capital works with labor to generate good outcomes. And we are going to force you to do that. Yes. Oh, sorry, before, can I add one other thing? The, I just want to thank you for making your point about that you're not a conservative, but this all sounded good. Because I, it's, it's a very important point, which is that one of the things that's going on here. Almost all. Sure. <laughs> but, but something that's going on here is a realignment. Yeah. And one of the reasons I think what I'm talking about is not just, to me at least, intellectually satisfying, but politically important, 
is that that libertarian group is actually is loud and extremely small. And trading those people out for the much, 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 much larger group of people who would frankly reasonable find non-conservative. reasonable non-conservative, that's, that's what, yeah, that, that's what the political scientists call you, um, is also a massive political win in the long run, I think. Rory. Thank you for your talk. And I see you're launching, so I, I, I offer some question comments in the spirit of uh, unsolicited advice. Um, I guess uh, I would just start by saying that you know there's a no tr no true Scotsman fallacy problem here. I've actually there've been a number of debates that I've, I've been able to attend recently or see on uh, televised. What is conservatism? A whole number of people will assemble and debate it, and I guess 90 percent of the people present normally don't agree with each of the speakers, but they still hold these 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 events. Uh, you know. In listening to the talk, I mean, to me, the big things that were missing, if this was a conservatism that I, I'm skeptical, but if I was to sign on to, was that there's not very much in the way of discussion of innovation. And there's a, there's a kind of static element to the way you discuss the economy, sort of the view from Washington, D.C. You survey this powerful economy, which is number one, and how shall it work best for the American people? And we can't just believe in free markets. That's kind of inhumane. and and nonsensical. Um, and your example to, that I would like focus on was when you said, well, is it really better for a unicorn? A unicorn, by the way, is, is not a, it's a mythical creature or a $1 billion plus uh, market cap new startup company. So would it be better for them to start up in, for a unicorn to set up shop, I think was your word, in San Francisco or in St. Louis? And you said, well, I think everyone would agree it would be better for St. Louis. There's a problem. Nobody is setting up shop in St. Louis because unicorns set up shop when there's four or five people working for them with almost no money. And they have to set up in San Francisco or somewhere like that in order to grow and become a billion dollar company that can relocate to Texas where taxes are lower and the conservatives are more free market. So I, I just wonder, I mean, what's, how do you see this dimension of competition and innovation, especially international? Again, the discussion of China was centered on trade. And you mentioned also, though, that we should have, we should be able to say, I guess, or you should be able to say as a conservative, we believe in manufacturing. That's great, but our semiconductor and uh, you know chip manufacturing and assembly of products, we don't have the, the United States does not have the capacity anymore. We've allowed that to cede to China and other countries, South Korea and so on. So we, it's great to say that we believe in manufacturing, but we can't ma manufacture Apple uh, iPhones here. It's not possible in the next at least five years. So I, I just sort of, to me that was a missing piece, but I have a suspicion that you have some ideas about that. So. Yeah. No, it, it's very well put. I mean, I would say, actually, if there were some reason why we needed to manufacture iPhones in this country, we could manufacture iPhones in this country in one year. I mean, like, five years is longer than the Manhattan Project took. So I, I, I'm pretty sure we could manufacture an iPhone here in less than five years. Or would anyone buy it when you can buy Samsung for <coughs> one-tenth the price it would cost? Well, that's a different question. <laughs> you, you were talking about it as a capacity and engineering question. These, and and I, I mean, I'm being a little bit pedantic, but I think it's a really important point that we have this like, well, that like, that's not how things work. And that's not how things work because we say that's not how things work. There's the, the actual constraints on um, things like what can you actually manufacture. There's, a, there's actually very good research on the question of if you did manufacture something, you know, an iPhone in the US, how much more expensive would it actually be? And putting aside the problem that we gave up all of our supply chains. And the answer is not that much more. It would be more expensive, but labor is not that big a component of it to begin with. And while US workers cost more, it would all, you, they are more productive, and, and so on and so forth. So, um, so, so I think there's, a, there's an element of the market fundamentalism I think we have to resist is to defend the market outcomes that we see today as inevitable and inviolable because they're not. They're a function of what we've set up around them. Um, second, and this isn't necessarily disagreeing with you, but I think it's worth highlighting, um, it, is, it is extremely funny and frustrating to see how we have shifted our argument from, well, it doesn't matter what we make here. Michael Boskin, um, who's George H.W. Bush's chair of his Council of Economic Advisors, famously said, potato chips, computer chips, what's the difference? Um, and Christina Romer, Obama's chair, in, as recently as 2011 or 2012, said essentially the same thing about hair dryers and haircuts. Um, and then once it's all gone, 
the exact same people turn around and say, well, obviously we can't make it here, be anything here, because all of the supply chains are over there now. And it's, it's very frustrating. Um, and so if you said, okay, well, we want to do something about that, um, what are the kinds of constraints? One thing you could do is you could have local content requirements. Like, I don't know that we need to make iPhones here, but if you take 5G as an example, if you said uh, actually building, you know, building out 5G is important and 5G technology and whatever we deploy in the future for our kind of nationwide communications networks um, must be made with things sourced domestically. Now, from where we stand today, that's like, well, that's a crazy policy. Surely, like, everything would... Yeah, that, was, that is our policy. But we begged Germany and we begged the United Kingdom and they rejected us. So I, I'm not sure what you're referring to. 5G, we've tried to block non-U.S. technology from the, those markets. No, we tried to tell them not to buy Huawei. We yeah. wanted them to use Ericsson or something else. Right. Yeah. I'm saying, what if you said in the U.S., it's, it's going to have to be built here? Uh, <laughs> and if you did that and you, if you actually created the latent demand for the stuff... Um, then you would, in fact, very quickly see a lot of investment flow to doing exactly that because that would now be a good way to earn profit in our economy. Um, so you can do it. I think the, you know, the unicorn example is, is then also, it's, it is a different flavor of exactly the same thing, which is, uh, yes, you're right. Today, with everything else exactly the way it is, obviously the unicorn is going to go to San Francisco or the, the prospective unicorn would want to set up in San Francisco. But, but that's the problem. The question is, should we step back and say, like, well, that's efficient. Let's move on to the next topic. Or should we say, gosh, that's actually probably not a great trajectory for our development. Uh, and certainly, should we have said 20 years ago, that's probably not what we want to have happen over the next 20 years. So uh, what is it that sends everybody to San Francisco? And what policy levers might we have? Now, one example of a policy lever we have is um, all of our funding support for higher education. If we said uh, federal research grants are now capped by MSA, so yes, everyone can try to work in Cambridge and Palo Alto, but they're going to be competing for the same this much grants, and there's going to be just as many grants also available to people at the very fine universities in St. Louis, uh, you would very quickly spread out the research uh, efforts nationwide. Now, I anticipate someone in the room is thinking, oh, but the research would be far less productive if it were spread out that way than as it is concerned. Right? To which I would say, first of all, that is, that is a merely an assertion for which there is, which we don't actually know is true. Uh, and secondly, yes, there are costs and benefits to things. And if the result of this were uh, some marginal decrease in the rate of certain types of innovation, but a much more broadly diffuse um, allocation of talent and innovation, I think, again, in the long run, that would probably be a lot better. Uh, so we could do that. We could also uh, design our tax code in a way that uh, your marginal tax rate was, was dictated by the wealth of uh, your zip code, not just your personal income. Like, well, that's a crazy outlandish thing. Like, no, it's not. Till 1913, we didn't even have an income tax. Why don't we say your the top marginal rate is 20% in most of the country, going up as high as 80% if you choose to live in a place where the average income is above a million dollars? That, that's actually not a rhetorical question. Why don't we do that? Ask Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> <laughs> um, Manny. Uh, Mr. Lopez. Yeah, I, I enjoyed the talk very much, and, and there are many things we can do. But my question is, what will we do? In other words, as a conservative, uh, uh, I'm sort of more impressed by political than economic forces and, 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 and sizing up uh, the power of nationalism, let's say, in China. You know, if one was an objective observer, we wouldn't say, I mean, whenever likes to say anything in praise of this of despotic country, but it, it does seem that the Chinese uh, can draw on a certain kind of uh, ethnic attachment and nationalism and, 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 and ask for sacrifices from its citizens that I, 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 I guess I don't see America now being able to, to do in the same way. And, and, and I, I'd like to think it was possible, but 
but, but, but I, I, I really doubt it. So for instance, it does seem to me, if we call China's bluff and, and, and say, well, it's either this or, well, we, we won't have trade with you, you know? We would win that. I do think we would win that. But will we do that? Because that would involve a huge disruption and sacrifice. I mean, one thing I imagine would certainly happen is that stock values would fall dramatically and a lot of people would be angry. And then in the U.S. we have elections and, uh, and you know, those, 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 uh, the, the ability of, of, of Americans to say, well, you know, it, it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough, but we need to do this as a people and so forth. I, I, I can see the, the Chinese constantly doing that I, I, and it, it, it resonating, and, 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 but, but with us, no. And 5G also is, 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 is a, to me, a, a, a shameful example for the U.S., shocking, because there's no question uh, that that's been the strength of the U.S., that kind of uh, technology and IP, for so long, and the Chinese have been so far behind, so ridiculously far behind. And then you get 5G, Huawei run, by a you know, military officer of China, uh, they set on this campaign very deliberately engaging in criminal acts of theft against American companies and, 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 and uh, Japanese companies. And then they, and, 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 and they end up holding the vast majority of IP on 5G. The only American company that comes anywhere, has any, any share that you could speak of in this, is, it's way behind, is Qualcomm. And what's striking about Qualcomm is it's being sued by the U.S. government. Why? <laughs> Complaints of Apple. One of the greatest friends China has is Apple. <laughs> and so, so that, again, speaks to, I think, the, the lack of, 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 of strength of political national, nationalism that's partly the effect of, 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 of a, a long-run effect of, of, of liberalism, I could say. But anyway, I, I just want you to address that, that question, the, the, that, that factor, uh, if you would. Yeah, I, I mean, I certainly think it's a fair point. I, you know, I'm not here to say uh, Mitch McConnell is going to ram this all through the Senate next week. Um, but I do think there's a, again, problem of looking at where we are and not where we should be going, which is like saying Pete Buttigieg would say, like, like, I apologize for my Pete Buttigieg meme. Um, but what I mean by it is that I think what you're describing is exactly right, and in a sense exactly what I mean when I say that we have not had conservative economics in this country for the last 40 years, um, and that that has been not just detrimental to a political, particular political coalition, I think has been detrimental to the way we as a nation think about a lot of these problems, that, that these fights have, and, and the way that we have been conditioned to process these issues play out in this incredibly narrow space between classical liberals and progressive liberals, where we all agree the goal is to grow the economic pie and maximize consumer welfare, and the only question is which set of policies grows the pie the fastest and how much cutting of the pie to do. And, and, and when you are in that, and by the way, and we are both going to assert that these are all purely win-wins, right, like right up through the Green New Deal and, and massive tax cuts, like equally ludicrous things to claim are pure win-wins. Um, and so merely as long, like there are no trade-offs in life thanks to the wonders of this weird ideology. Um, and yet... If you step back and like try to poll the actual American people on what they believe, um, what I am describing and calling actual conservatism, I believe the best data suggests like you can get about 40 percent of the country for that. There are kind of significant segments that are um, kind of pro-business, you know, conservative and sort of very progressively socially liberal. And then there's like the two percent that's actually like. I'm socially liberal and fiscally conservative, Michael Bloomberg libertarian. Um, and so there's all sorts of interesting political science questions about why we have nevertheless ended up where we have. I recommend Michael Lind's book, The New Class War, which I think looks as a very interesting take on kind of how these political continuums have developed. Um, but I don't know what would happen if people actually started talking this way. And if if we have learned anything from Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders, it's that there are an awful lot of ways to get up and talk that 
people thought like, well, obviously you can't talk like that, that are in fact wildly more popular than the way everyone was talking. And so obviously we will not be, I'm not, you know, we will not be China and, and, and proceed down that path. But America has a actually pretty good track record, whether it's the repeated religious revivals or, um, you know, what, what were periods of, you know, an extremely protectionist regime through the late 19th century, kind of very, you know, launching the war on poverty in the 60s um, <coughs> of actually doing some of these things. And so, no, we won't get 100% of what I'm talking about, um, but I certainly think we can do better than we're doing now. Um, I'm going to ask a question because no one else has asked it yet um, about, um, I, I, about um, the family and, um, and women. Um, so I, I sense, uh, well, first, and there's an emanation of pro-Trump from what you say, and also a penumbra of um, anti-feminism. Uh, that uh, some, uh, that um, you raised doubts about the value of a, of a two-income family, uh, which actually uh, Elizabeth Warren has herself as well. So, what about that, and uh, what would you say? Um, it's partly what, what you understand uh, the conservative interest in the family to be. Well, when you say anti-feminism, I think the question is which feminism. Um, True. The, mm. uh, the, the basic, what I would call actual feminism of saying that men and women should have political, economic, social, legal, civil equality uh, and the same set of options open to them, I am, I'm 100% on board with. Um, the idea that the outcome we should be striving in society is a world where 50% of the senior executives in every Fortune 500 company are women, which is an actual like thing they are pledging, um, I think is absurd. And it is not reflective of what women say they want. And for women who do want that, they should absolutely have that opportunity and should not have any obstacles to pursuing it. But if you set that as the goal, then you actually end up with a very strange problem, which is that when you're setting your hiring policies and promotion policies and so forth, you actually have to discriminate against people who want anything else. Uh, you actually have to advance a model that, uh, you know, we have to go down this path of sort of, let's make sure we have a paid leave system that ensures that women are working right up until the moment the child is born and surely will return to work shortly thereafter. Uh, and don't you dare suggest that you have any sort of other flexible options that they might prefer, because if you do, then that's going to ripple forward into different outcomes down the road. Uh, and so it seems to me that we both should have a much more aggressively pluralistic acceptance of what people want and recognize that, therefore, the outcomes we are going to see, based on what we know people say they want, are not going to be perfectly statistically distributed. And then secondly, I think we should actually be comfortable having a view of an actual affirmative preference, which is that uh, we should want families that have a parent staying home with kids, especially when they're young. And it can be either parent, and it's for that family to decide. But uh, when we are thinking about um, the well-being of the children. I mean, it's actually funny. One of the places where there's actually very good, consistent social science research right now is that daycare really is not very good for little kids. Like, studies keep coming out on that, and everyone keeps getting very upset about them, and then they keep coming out. And like, oh, like, really, are we going to be stunned that, like, the way that humans evolved to raise children and have in all cases throughout history, like, is proving to be a good way to do it? I think we should probably be comfortable saying that. Um, and then we should also equally value all of the other things that it means to have somebody doing work outside the market, which we don't today. OK, but listen, um, uh, aren't you making, in, in regard to the family, uh, an exception to your rule that consumer preferences, as they are now, shouldn't rule? Oh, no, because... Uh, because, yeah. Isn't it the case that either you're for feminism or you're against it? 
and it's true there are different feminisms, but m most of them favor um, uh, 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 the principle that a woman should uh, leave the house and have a career and get the kind of, same kind of honor in respectability in life that, uh, that uh, a man can get. Well, first of all, don't you either have to push in favor of feminism or against it? No, just to be clear, are you against the suffragettes? Would you take away the vote? I mean, let's go all the way. <laughs> yeah, don't raise utopian questions. <laughs> I would like to I would like to disassociate myself from that comment. Um, first of all. No, I reject your you are for feminism or against feminism because I uh -huh. think it gives far too much power to radicals to define the term in ways that is not what most people actually understand the term to be and, and really confuses the debate. So I think to the extent that the term has therefore become unuseful, uh, we have to talk about what we are actually for or against. And that's why I distinguish civil, political, legal, economic um, equality of opportunity from seeking perfectly distributed outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, with respect to the thinking about how things are versus how they might be, uh, I would speak in my own defense in, in two respects. One, um, I am speaking about how people would like it to be. That is, um, people consistently report on surveys, um, women consistently report on surveys wishing that they were not working full-time and are dissatisfied with the extent to which they are working, particularly when they have young kids. Um, and both men and women across races, across education levels, um, share that view. So it is in a sense, just as, as people have consistently for a long time said they wish they could have more, had more kids than they have. Um, so that's one component. And then the second component is the idea that sort of um, career success is the measure of sort of honor and standing in a community. I'm not going to deny that there are places where that is the case. Um, but I am going to deny, one, that it is widespread the case. That is, it's very funny that the exact same progressives who insist that Obviously, it's incredibly important that women be in the workforce to accomplish those things. Also, then turn around and lament all of the horrible bullshit jobs and terrible employment conditions and how bad jobs are. I mean, it's fine to say like, well, obviously, being a Harvard professor is great. But the idea that like raising a family and being an active member of a community and doing all of those things is like less fulfilling or rewarding or honorable or respected than the median job in this country I don't think is true. And to the extent it is true, that is something we should change and be very comfortable standing up and saying you are wrong about. Very good. Those are very anti-feminist remarks. Those are extremely <laughs> pro-feminist <laughs> remarks. Okay. Tom. Your criticisms of conservative conventions is that it's better to have more people working. And um, uh, uh, in this advanced technological society, it isn't just the Yang gang that wants a guaranteed annual income, but um, you know, uh, even Charles Murray has suggested it too. I just wonder what you thought about that, which sort of removes that that element of criticism. Um, yeah, I, I disdain universal basic income. Um, the <laughs> the <coughs> excuse me um, for. So for a couple of reasons. One, and, and this sort of goes to the substantive, how do the, the components of this fit together, is it seems to me the standard that we should be calling for is self-sufficient households. That, that the family is the relevant unit of economic analysis, and a family should be a productive contributor to a community and able to support itself. Not obviously by growing its own food and make its own medicine, but by creating as much value into the society as it needs to take in the market as it needs to take from it. Um, I think that that is a very good thing to focus on uh, in part because of the implications for life satisfaction and, um, and meaning and community and culture, um, but also because of those ends we were talking about like limited government. That if what we actually want at the end of the day is the society of free people and limited government, I think that has to be the table stakes 
that we are building around. And universal basic income, I think, abandons that. Um, there are two more political reasons that I, I strongly object to universal basic income. Um, one is that it's a, it is a release valve, get out of jail free card. It is the upper class saying, wow, we are going in a bad direction. Um, I'm not at willing to actually contemplate any changes or sacrifices of any nature, so please let me know to whom I need to write my check. And I think we need to take that off the table and say, no, no, the only acceptable set of solutions is the ones where there are actual sacrifices made to try to correct these challenges. Um, and then the second problem, and, and this goes to the question of like, well, is it a good idea? Like, what would the policy effects of it be? I, I'm a huge skeptic of evidence-based policy and the impulse to like, well, let's just pilot it and send people checks for a year and see what happens. Um, because choosing a random group of people and sending them a check for a year is called a lot. That's that's the lottery. <laughs> that's that's not an actual measure of what it would mean to a society to shift to a model where it is no longer your responsibility to provide for yourself and your family. And I think we have a much better proxy to look at, um, which is how we raise children in this society, because we actually we can look around and we can say, actually, gosh, most people, especially the elites who are calling for this stuff actually have enough money to set up the equivalent of a basic income for their kid. Like if we actually if we actually thought that was the right environment to raise kids in, you can do it right now. And this isn't like a chicken hawk, why don't you send your kid off to war argument? Because there we all agree that it is a sacrifice to be sent off to war. Here the claim is the basic income is actually good for the recipient. So if you actually think the basic income is good for the recipient, well then why, ha like by all means, let's get started. Uh, but we don't, because in fact, we all know, and again, this is a conservative assertion about things we can say about human nature without having run a pilot, that that is a terrible model for society. And the incredible tragedy of, of the basic income is that there is no opt out. So the basic income is the equivalent of your crazy uncle Sam showing up at Thanksgiving and telling your kid, he just set that up. And then come and come by every few weeks just to remind your kid that when they turn 18, if they just want to go smoke pot and backpack around Europe, they can do that. And and as soon as families are like, yeah, that's great. I hope someone does that. Like, like then we will be headed toward a basic income. And and until then, I think we should be comfortable, sort of pointing out its ludicrousness. Yes, Peter. Quick question. So I, I, I enjoyed your talk, and I read your working hypothesis piece this morning, and I'm not that familiar with your work other than this and what I've heard here. But here's my question. I mean, part of what you're saying, I think, goes back to the thing, and you showed some economic statistics going back to the 70s and pretty in post-war, where things were, quote, unquote, good, basically, for the, the baby boomer generation. And now, I guess the premise is they're not so good for a lot of people. Is that kind of, do I hear you kind of saying that? Is that part of, part of what's going on? Because you're, you're saying capitalism isn't working for a lot of people now, so you've got some prescriptions in here, taxes and subsidies and things. Is that, do I kind of hear, do I have that right? Yeah, the way, I, I, I get very uncomfortable with the good, not good yeah. description. Because um, then we have to get into a whole lot of like, well, like how we define right. that. Yeah. What the, I think the point that I'm trying to make with those illustrations is that markets can operate in different ways and generate different kinds of outcomes. And the way that they were behaving and the outcomes they were generating were better and closer to what we would like to see markets delivering than what they are doing okay. now. Got it. Okay, so here's my question. So if we think about the post-war generation up through the 70s, the, the, the rest of the global economy was sort of a shambles. Mm -hmm. Japan was destroyed. Europe was destroyed. We kind of had it all to ourselves. So we're kind of overachieving, maybe. If, I don't know if that's the right word, but we we're overachieving relative to where we might have been otherwise. And then what happened, Japan came back and they took our auto, her auto industry a lot of other industries. And then China came in and did sort of the same thing. So now we've been underachieving. So maybe the relative, we look back and we say, gosh, things are really good in the 60s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and then they deteriorated. And now they're really bad, quote bad, but um, maybe the, the, the actual sort of equilibrium is in the middle somewhere. And maybe these prescriptions that you're saying are not the right prescription to take because we're kind of in a cycle. Maybe there's some self-correcting that's gonna take place over time. If you let capitalism, the invisible hand work a little bit, 
I mean, that strikes me as a dr as an example of the drunk donkey fallacy. Like, I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't know. <clears throat> I, 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 I mean, <clears throat> but the reason I say that is, I, I don't, I don't think that there's anything about the invisible hand that would do that. That's not, that's not the claim about the invisible hand, and so. I would be, and, and that's why I like this Hayek quote where he's just asserting sort of faith in spontaneous forces. So much of Hayek's work is fantastic because he actually does the work to say like, here is how the price system works and how these things translate and why you get the results you get. And that's fantastic. But when you cross over to the, well, because we have an intuition that markets are good, we're just gonna start asserting that if you just let the market do its thing, some good thing we want will happen. I, I just I don't think that's that's a valid analytical approach. You would have to tell me what it is, either empirically that you're observing or that you expect to happen, that would cause that well, upswing. Saying, I mean, you had a, a huge portion of the global economy that really didn't operate effectively for many years post-war, gave us a huge tailwind, and then now it's come back in in the last 30 or 40 years, giving us a huge headwind. And maybe now things, China, you can see jobs are moving from China now to like cheaper places like Vietnam. So maybe the, the, the economy. I'm not sure that helped. That, that, I'm not sure how that helps us. I mean, there are well, 4 no. billion people poorer than the Chinese. Right, but I want to say <laughs> is they, they, the wages in China were really, really low, and now they're coming back. Maybe they're correct. Self, it's a self correcting thing. And that'll happen in, in Vietnam eventually, too. And it'll sort of be good for everybody. Like so, like two hundred years from now, after the entire, I, I, I apologize. That was a, that was a little bit um, snide. But this is yeah. I don't I don't I don't see any actual mechanism there that you've described, but beyond faith that markets are good. So we should try to tell a just so story about that. Yeah. I'm also not sure about the the tailwind story because it's on the one hand it's absolutely correct that the rest of the global economy was was in shambles, but levels of trade were actually very low. So it's not the case that it, we were doing some sort of East Asian style export led growth. It's just a case that we were just kind of doing our own thing would be a fair characterization. I agree. In which case I would say like, well then isn't that just an argument for no trade? I don't think it is and there are a bunch of reasons it's not. But if what you're saying is, well, well gosh, when there wasn't global trade and we just had our domestic market, we had all these great things and high levels of innovation, and then once we started having a lot of global competition, it went away. Like, you could conclude some different things from that, is all I'm saying. Yeah, no, I, I know you could, you're right. But I'm saying, if we look back, and like my parents, they had, you know, they're, they're long retired now, they had things quote unquote good, and now younger people and millennials don't have things good according to sort of the narrative. Um, the, um, you know, it's part, partly because of those reasons. All those people came back in the workforce and depressed wages here and whatnot. So I, I think we look back, we make the comparison that you made, you know, the distribution chart that you showed and how it's changed since 1979. Um, you know, some of that was sort of forces that, you know, were artificial in a way. So maybe, maybe this is the, we look back and we say things are really good. Now they're not so good. Maybe the comparison isn't, really back then, then, you know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't see the, uh, you know what I'm saying? No, uh, I'm, look, and that's fair. My argument isn't that, well, we should just go back to the 1960s or, you know, well, let's get back to 90% marginal tax rates and 40%, you know, right. unionization. It's that there is nothing inevitable about what we have right now. Yep. And we should feel comfortable saying that what we have right now is not actually what we want and that we're probably going to have to do something about it. Yeah. Uh, one more question to empower women. Okay, so you, um, you, know, you, you talk about a lot of different changes uh, kind of happening at the same time. Um, is there another country that you feel does it better in terms of balancing market forces, regulating them in the way that serves the national interests of the people? Is there an example or uh, multiple examples? Or? There, I mean, there are, there are a bunch of sort of of examples of components of it. Um, and so, you know, one thing I think if you look at, at Northern Europe, one of the things, two things Northern Europe does very well, I would say, is they have an aggressive affirmative emphasis on maintaining a manufacturing sector. Uh, and they have an education system that much more heavily emphasizes non-college pathways. Yeah, and, it's, and, and um, Germany, Switzerland, 
um, some of the Nordics, sort of you're talking more like Denmark, Netherlands, et cetera. Um, so like they, I think, do that sort of component of it very well. Um, some of the East Asian countries, I think, have done a much better job of, frankly, resisting globalization in a sense and actually maintaining a domestic set. I mean, obviously, they trade a ton, but a sense that the domestic economy is operated for the domestic workforce um, and that I think there's a higher level of solidarity that comes up comes with that. But there's also a much higher level of ethnic homogeneity as well. Um, and then a really strange example <coughs> that's unfair in many ways, but also fascinating, is Israel. Um, Israel is fascinating because, first of all, the, its fertility rate is through the roof, and not because of the Orthodox Jews. The secular Jewish fertility rate in Israel looks unlike anything else in the developed world. Um, they have, uh, and they have pursued an incredibly aggressive industrial policy to become this you know, incredibly diverse, advanced, innovative economy from a starting point where I don't know what theory of comparative advantage and economics you could come up with where you're like, well, looking around, like, Israel's going to have more companies on the NASDAQ than, like, any country but, you know, than any country but the U.S. Um, it, 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 had a, it has a much more intentional approach. Now, there are some very unique things that you can't replicate, about Israel, like the fact that it is under constant existential threat, which helps with the kind of cohesiveness, um, like the fact that it has a universal conscript conscription program um, that that accomplishes a tremendous amount, that deprioritizes college, builds cross socioeconomic networks. And so it's not like you'd say like, well, we should just implement those laws. But I think it is informative to look and see that you can have that, that there are different knobs in a modern liberal society that can be in very different positions and can actually generate very different outcomes. Well, thanks. This has been wonderfully disruptive. Thank you,